We might make a start. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the LIDS seminar. Uh, if you're in Melbourne, you'll know the weather's terrible. If you're in Perth or somewhere else, well, I hope the sun's shining because it's pretty cold and wet here. Um, this afternoon, we have a really interesting seminar with two speakers, and it's around revisiting issues about ageing with a disability. Um, and I guess the reason it's called revisiting is that this has been an issue that's been on the agenda in Australia um, really for the last 30 years, and we don't seem to have made a lot of progress. Um, today's an opportunity to look where we've come from in terms of understanding issues around ageing with disability in general, and then in particular around issues for people ageing with intellectual disabilities. It's also an opportunity to promote a, a book that's just been published, which is edited uh, by Michelle Putnam, who's the first speaker, and by myself, which is a handbook of ageing with disability, which is published by uh, Rootledge Handbooks. And there should be information available for that and a discount uh, flyer that came out with some of the material. So the first speaker is Michelle Putnam, um, who has recorded a, a presentation for us, which is really based on the introduction to the book and the conclusion of the book. And what she's going to do is take a very broad uh, perspective about the knowledge building in the field of ageing with disability. Where are we? Where have we come from? And what do we need to know? She's going to speak for about 40 minutes and then we might uh, see if we can field some questions, if anybody has questions or comments, and please put them in the Q&A. And then we'll have a quick break and then Tal Ariton Bergman will talk about um, the research that she's been doing more currently in Australia around ageing and people with intellectual disabilities. So this is a recording, so um, we think the quality is okay. It's because she's in us in America and it's the middle of the night and she really uh, couldn't manage to to get up and be with us. So we'll make a start now. Over to you, David. This presentation is really meant to give a sense of where we're at in terms of building a field of knowledge in aging with disability. So it's a bit of an overview, um, but. I think it helps set up the idea of trying to understand where we are, where we need to go, and hopefully we'll give you a sense of how to frame this topic as you think about maybe doing some additional reading or exploring into the field. First, I thought I would lay this out in terms of thinking about where does aging with disability belong? Um, we often think about it as a subfield. We can also think about it as its own field of inquiry and knowledge. But I've made this diagram to show that it really sits at the intersection between the disciplines of gerontology, um, focus on intellectual disability, studies of physical disability, and studies of psychiatric disability. No one discipline owns the field of aging with disability. And I've listed on the sides of this diagram fields that have contributed to it. There are, there are more that are listed here, but primarily we see contributions in the study of the experience of aging with disability within social work, public health, rehabilitation, sociology, psychology, medicine, nursing, environmental design, robotics, economics, and occupational therapy. An important thing to think about is are these intersections and how these fields are, some of them are interdisciplinary, some of them are uh, not so interdisciplinary, but they're, they do cover a range of areas that are important for living with aging with disability. So my first question is, where are we at in terms of knowledge building? 
So this is the big view. <laughs> and again, I know this isn't getting into the smaller details. At the end of this presentation, I'll give you a reference for a handbook that I have co-edited with Dr. Chris Bigby. That's a good source of a lot of this information. And much of this presentation comes from the first and the last chapters of that book. What I wanted to do here is just give you a sense of where, what's the timeline for studying aging with disability and what's in that timeline. And I didn't put any dates on here, but roughly speaking, we don't really see anyone investigating the experience of aging with disability until sometime in the 1970s, although that's, that's really early. We see much, much more of it happen, um, a bigger start, I guess you would say in the 1980s, and then from then it's continued on. In this timeline, I wanted to give you just a kind of a general sense of the topics that we've seen studied over the years. And this is not necessarily, um, this is not rewarding the results of a systematic review of the literature. This is just sort of a general thematic um, presentation of what's, what do we know, what's in there? So we started with a kind of a medical analysis that thought about abnormal aging or what was happening to people who were growing older with disabilities. And some of that focused on dementia and moved on to look at accelerated aging. So experiences that or um, traits that we normally associate with people at older ages happening to people at younger ages. And then we see sort of a big bubble of research come in around caregiving and families and life course issues. And really a lot of this and even some of the earlier work mostly relates to people with intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities. In the United States, we lump those groups together. I know in other places, um, they're not necessarily lumped together or put together. Um, but we see this focus on caregiving, families, parents and siblings, future planning. So what happens when parents pass away um, in particular, and some focus on individual health of the person with disability. Now during this time period, it's not just individuals with intellectual disabilities that um, research and scholarship is focusing on. We start to see more around people with physical disabilities, particularly spinal cord injury, um, polio. Those are people with polio, those are big groups. And then more later, so probably somewhere around the 2000s, I would say, we see perk up um, considerations of participation, engagement, life satisfaction. And we've seen that start there and much more continue on into present day topics like employment, retirement, housing and independent living and self-determination and choice. And that kind of takes us up to where we are now. So again, this is just a really rough overview, but I think the main point I wanted to convey is that a lot of the initial scholarship and research and knowledge building focused on these quote unquote abnormal aging or, or things that were noticed to be happening in a very medical way. And we've moved much farther and trying to get away from just understanding um, medical conditions or symptoms or physiological change to understanding how people live their lives. And that's where we are, I think, now and moving towards how do you live a life? How do you have a good life in old age? Many of the same topics and issues we see in the field of gerontology in general. All of that said, so that timeline looks like we've made a lot of progress. And we have, but we're still working through some fundamental questions and parameters um, that frame these populations and issues. And a lot of these questions oftentimes slow down our research and slow down our knowledge building because they're unsettled and they're not, um, people aren't quite certain who this aging with disability population is. So here are some big questions that are still out there. How do we define this aging with disability population? How big is the population of people aging with disability? Why is aging with disability a new phenomenon? And I should probably put that new in quotes right there. Um, it's decades old, but it's still new um, to a lot of researchers, a new idea, a new concept. And then how is aging with disability different than aging into disability? So how is living long-term 
um, or most of your life with disability different than experiencing disability for the first time in later life? And I've put in the blue box here that these remain important questions because um, ongoing discussions about the interactions, intersections of aging and disability aren't always clear. So trying to figure out what should be attributed to the process of aging, normal process of aging, what should be attributed to disability, and what is really at that unique intersection. When they come together, how do we know that this is a unique aging with disability experience? Those questions sometimes just circle around and they can prevent people from moving on in terms of knowledge building. Um, and that, that becomes an issue too, and I'll talk about that as we go on. But I wanted to give you some answers to these as well, or some general thoughts, I should, should say. So how is the aging with disability population defined? Well, I've made this chart, two charts, I guess. Um, there are really two key traits. One is trying to understand age of onset, and the other one is duration of disability. These are both markers of time. So we think about age of onset, disability can or impairment or a difference in a condition can start at birth. So it's something you could be uh, born with or born with a characteristic and traits. It's something that you could acquire early in childhood or more early adulthood. And we might think about that as someone's 20s or 30s or even 40s. And then at midlife, thinking about 40s, 50s, some people would argue 60s. <laughs> um, that that's when the first onset of disability is. So that is a marker of where we might start to measure or describe um, and identify people in these populations by age of onset. The other is duration of disability. So how long has a person experienced disability? And within there, you'll see these three arrows becomes it becomes important to consider, are we talking about the condition someone has? So maybe it's just a trait um, or um, a feature. Uh, maybe somebody's been diagnosed with a certain condition, but there's not a lot of symptoms from it or not a lot of um, uh, sort of effect of that, of that um, condition. And then the next is, you know, from there, somebody may move into having an impairment or really being able to identify different abilities that the person has. Um, and that's different than just the condition. So when you were diagnosed with something, it doesn't necessarily tell us how long you've been experiencing any sort of difficulty or how long it's been noticeable or impacting people or cultural or physical and the mismatch between the environment and the person and that started to create um, some sort of inability to do what the person wanted to do and that's where we can think about disability so those two time markers become important in terms of segmenting out this population and identifying who's aging with disability and who is experiencing disability in later life, maybe for the first time. And what we're really trying to identify are people who are living with disability for a long period of time. It could be their entire life. It could be half their life. It could be, you know, 10 years or so, but a longer period of time before later life. That's what we're looking for. The next question is how big is this population? And this, this is mostly relevant or understanding size in terms of solutions or trying to problem solve. So a lot of our supports and services, regardless of what nation they're provided in, or regardless of what laws that are out there, because most countries have some, some policies related to helping people who have disabilities. It's important to be able to understand how large the group is that you're talking about. And one of the challenges for the aging with disability population is that we don't have a clear estimate of that population size. And one reason is it's hard to measure this group. For the reasons that I just mentioned, you have to decide if you're talking about age of onset, you have to decide if you're talking about duration of disability or both. But what parameters do you put around this group is one piece. The second piece is how do we define disability? Is it 
you know, work-related disability? Is it a disability related to function? Um, but there were all sorts of definitions of disability. So trying to figure out how are we going to define disability and then how does that relate to our identifying the size of this population? Another challenge is thinking about whether we're asking for somebody to have a professional diagnosis of a certain condition, like multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury or intellectual disability, or are we okay with a self-report, somebody telling us that they have this condition? And that matters because generally the people who have a diagnosis, that's a smaller number of people than people who might self-report a condition. And finally, there's just a general lack of representation in data sets for the most part. It's certainly true in the United States, and I know it's true in other countries as well. Often the data sets that we have don't ask these timing questions. They don't ask about when did a disability start, or if you have a certain condition, when, what, what age were you diagnosed with that, um, or when did you first experience disability. Uh, those aren't in the data. So we're not able to look at some of these, you know, nationally representative data sets and, and find the aging with disability population in it. What we tend to do, and you'll see in the next box of global estimates, is have to proxy this population size by trying to capture how many people have been diagnosed with a certain condition. So multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, and then add those groups up and say that it's roughly a certain size. So when we do that with some of the major groups, we can say that globally, it's, we know that there are roughly um, 200 million people or more who are aging with disability. That's pretty, that's probably not a great estimate. It's probably a lot more than that. But because we don't have the data, we have difficulty talking about the size. And because of that, um, it just relates to some struggles with trying to really capture attention related to this population and define it um, in the same way that we would be able to define just the population of people with disabilities overall. Another question that's always out there is why is aging with disability a new phenomenon? So one of the challenges we have had as scholars in this field is to really get attention to this aging with piece. And people are interested in older adults, people are interested in, in um, research with people with disabilities in general, um, including those who are you know, not older adults. So children, midlife adults, early adults. But it's been a challenge to bring in this idea that we need to look at aging and aging with. And part of that is because it's been kind of a stealthy phenomenon. What's happened is that people who have um, onset of disability in early life and in midlife are living longer than they have in the past. But because we don't have the data, we haven't captured that as well as we probably should have. Um, but some of the reasons are that there are stronger social care programs, better health care for individuals, both in terms of health care insurance, access to care, quality of care provided. Um, there are more opportunities for public education, employment and employment supports. There are newer civil rights laws in the United States with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has really changed how we think about inclusion of people with disabilities and there are economic supports and others. And so what's happened is uh, as these supports and services and changes in our ability to help people live well and be healthy with disability has evolved, people have begun to live longer. And as I noted, that's been pretty stealthy. A lot of people haven't necessarily noticed unless you're working with this population, then you do. Now, one of the other challenges, though, is that although the lifespans are longer, they're still less than people who are not aging with disability. And again, we don't have a lot of data to quantify this, but we have some. And we know that access to and the adequacy of health and social and economic resources remain unequal between this population and people who don't have disabilities. 
And we know that practice and programs, practices and programs, formal and formal, remain underdeveloped. So one of the challenges is that while we see lifespan increasing and length of life years added to it, we still know that there are many groups where it's artificially limited because we're still not providing the, the care, support, the assistance that we could be that could make um, lives even better and stronger. And that, that's an issue. Just briefly, one example would be a lot of people with disabilities as they um, age and over time, the knowledge base on um, working with people with disability from a healthcare provider perspective is pretty limited. So people may not be receiving the same treatments, the same interventions, the same quality of care um, as people without disabilities. And that may have a negative impact on the chronic conditions they have um, or other um, diseases they might incur as they become older um, and the treatments they get. So that can lead to lesser care and that can lead to a shorter lifespan. So here's the other question that I think a lot of us, a lot of us in this field get often, which is how is aging with different Hey, I was aging with disability different than aging into disability. What's the real difference? And it's difficult to explain without case examples, because as I mentioned, we're a little short on data in some cases to really look at changes or effects over the life course. There are some really strong data sets out there in areas like spinal cord injury and some in intellectual disability that we could change over the over time, but we don't have the amount of data that we do for people who are aging without disability. So it's often that these vignettes help us um, explain to people what's really different here. And so here's one case example, and then, then I'll give you a second one. In this first one, we see Lisa, she's a woman with intellectual disability and she lives independently in her community. She works at a local supermarket. She never marries and she never has children. At 52, she's ready to retire, but her family worries that if she does, her social network will shrink. And there are a few programs for older persons with intellectual disability and Lisa's town. And so that may affect her um, ability to make new friends and stay engaged. Her parents are in their early eighties. Her mother cares for her father who has dementia and is unable to socially engage as much as she would like to with her daughter. Lisa's 62-year-old neighbor, Monique, on the other hand, has also never married and is retired. She has one parent caring for the other parent, but she has a strong social network through her church and the high school alumni group, and she drives a car. So these two women are seem slightly different on the surface, when we look at where they're at and what their networks are, but we know that somebody with an intellectual disability, once you leave that job and once you leave that employment position where you have friends and a social connection, it's harder to retire and make new friends. The services and supports may not be there to help you. And you may not be able to drive. You may be dependent on transportation provided um, through a public transportation system or through programs and services. And you may not be as anchored in to networks in the community as other individuals. And this may be related to your personality, it may be related to many things, but it also can be related to stigma and disability discrimination that's out there as well. So it becomes important to sort of qualitatively look at what are the differences here and what are the concerns we have about somebody who might retire, lose their social network, and then become lonely and isolated? Where does their quality of life go? How does their health change? Um, what does that mean for um, you know, active aging and positive, meaningful experiences in later life? Those are concerns we have about people who are growing older with disability. And here's another example. So we have Mark who's an individual who's, who sustained a spinal cord injury at age 40. And we have another individual who sustained a spinal cord injury at age 70, Ben. 
They may share parts of the Asian with disability experience, particularly those related to initial medical treatment, rehabilitation, and a use of assistive equipment to navigate a home and community environment. However, what may differ substantially is the impact of the injury on the individual every day. So for Mark, the 40-year-old, he may no longer be able to work or he may have difficulty finding work that accommodates his disability. And that likely will impact his ability to save for retirement. And he might be financially less secure in later life than he otherwise might have been if he, if he hadn't incurred the spinal cord injury where Ben at age 70 may have already stopped working and have a sufficient retirement savings to live securely in later life. So in this case, we are really just looking at age of onset in many ways and what the implications have for incurring a substantial disability in earlier life versus later life. And we don't make any judgment about Mark's ability to work. He may be able to work, but he may not find work due to discrimination in employment markets or maybe some flexibility he needs in the workplace that isn't necessarily provided. So we want both Mark and Ben to do well in later life and have meaningful old ages. But when we're thinking about the person aging with disability, we need to think a little bit more critically about what happens in earlier life and how does that translate into what later life looks like for people who are aging with disabilities. Now, all of that said, it's going to be hard to give you the full overview of where we're at in terms of knowledge building in a short presentation. So I wanted to just make this little chart and show it to you. We're still working towards building the knowledge base in all these domains. There are not that many researchers and scholars in the field of aging with disability. We're roughly estimating, Dr. Bigby and I, um, probably two or 300 globally working in this area. Hopefully we're underestimating that, but it's certainly not a large number of people. And so it's a lot of people trying to do work on a lot of different levels. But one of our challenges has been advancing theory trying to look at ecological models, which are the person in their environment, um, social models of disability, um, how people interact with those social systems, and how we think about disability as a social construction. There are medical and rehabilitation models, which sometimes are thought of as being a little bit outdated, but at the same time, we, we do really want to understand physiological changes that people are experiencing with disability. Those are important to know as people grow older. And then some newer frameworks, thinking about social determinants of health, those models become important to try to understand more globally, more holistically, how all of the elements fit together um, in a theoretical framework to affect a person's quality of life or their ability to live well in later life. Increasing research in these areas has been important. Health and wellness, independent living, symptom management, so pain, fatigue are often symptoms, sometimes memory, um, hearing, those are things um, people can experience changes with early on or as they grow older that we might want to think about um, more critically and what their influence are on um, people's decisions about what they want to do and how they want to do it on programs and services, and then on welcoming communities. So we've seen sort of an evolution through this list over time, where now we're looking more broadly at communities, but definitely we need to keep increasing research in all of these areas. What we have is somewhat limited and modest, to be truthful. And then the other thing we need to do is really keep learning from stakeholders, understanding their experiences, identifying priority knowledge, what's important to people aging with disabilities, where should scholarship head, what, should, what types of research should we be focusing on that are meaningful for people who are living these lives of aging with disability. Thinking about that and always keeping that in the forefront is important. And then um, engagement, of scholar, engagement and scholarship of stakeholders becomes an important issue. So including people with disabilities 
in scholarship and in building the knowledge base is critical. And then finally, translating to and learning from practice becomes important. Because we have a modest knowledge base that's research um, grounded in aging with disability, um, it's really critical that we also think about what are people learning in the field. So we're kind of going to learn as you go mode in a lot of places. Um, but people are developing, they have practice wisdom, they work with people who are aging with disabilities. Um, so what do they know? What's happening out there? How can they help us shape the knowledge building and research domains? We have manualization of interventions. So what does that mean? That really just means like we, we're far enough along in some of these areas that there actually are trainings and protocols and interventions out there for things like how to retire well with an intellectual disability, how to make sure people understand um, or help people build social networks, um, those sorts of things, health and wellness promotion. So we do have some evidence-based practices that we are able to draw on um, that can be disseminated out to practitioners to help support people who are aging with disabilities. And then also community-based living and community-based care are important areas where we can continue to build the knowledge base, but also learn from what are the practices happening out there in the field. So I, I think just to sort of try to wrap this together a little bit more, one of the challenges in this field is that the research is progressing, but there's a modest number of researchers. So the knowledge base, the evidence-based knowledge base is building slowly. But at the same time, we know that there are more people who are aging with disability and that practice base is also developing. So we really wanna think about how to bring those two together to try to build some synergy so we can develop this knowledge base overall uh, in a more efficient way, in a more meaningful way, to make sure we're meeting people's needs. And then I want to highlight that we've kind of only made some modest progress in bridging fields. So that chart I showed you at the beginning with gerontology, physical disability, psychiatric disability, and intellectual disability, if you think about those as four different domains, um, where we often attach scholarship and research to those, those populations. One of the ideas about bridging fields is that you would start to build knowledge across fields to really fill in that center circle, do you remember, of the aging with disability. So what's happened, um, and I can speak, you know, from my own experience in the, in the United States, one of the things that's happened is, is people realize that adults who are aging with disability and thought about the aging phenomena, there wasn't necessarily, there hasn't been much of a build, bridge building across fields. And I know that's the case in some other countries as well. It's more that we've built bridges going in the same direction. So I have this picture of bridges um, where there are two bridges over water. And that to me is a little bit where the United States is, is that we, we still have parallel systems, one for people with disabilities who are younger than 64, and one for people who are older than 65. So we call them disability programs and services and services for older adults. And they may be almost identical in terms of what the services are, um, but the access to or provision or amounts of services awarded to people may be different. And if you step outside the public service sector, it can just be in our general practices, whether it's in healthcare or our, our general way of thinking in general. It doesn't and it can be privately delivered services or programs or employment. It can be lots of different things. Um, but the way that we think about them, we really still have parallel systems going. We just sort of increase the length of um, time that we think about disability services in particular being delivered to people. So we think about including people with disabilities, keeping them in our disability service system longer as they grow older, instead of trying to think about how do we modify our programs and services for older adults to be more inclusive of people with disabilities. So in that way, we haven't really built bridges across. We've just extended our bridges in some way. 
So that's been one challenge. And then I have this bridge over the canal and in this very old town. But to me, that is an interesting image. And I circled in red the building across the bridge because that's a lot of the work that we need to do. It's not building these parallel bridges <laughs> and um, having people become more expert within their, their own lane. What we need to do is build knowledge across fields. And that may mean that we come up with something new as this image is. There are buildings on the left and buildings on the right. And then there's this completely different building in the middle, but it connects the two. And I think that's a little bit where we need to think about bridging aging with disability and creating that um, piece that connects the two, not just in name, but in substance. And it may be that it becomes its, its own unique um, discipline or its own unique sense, sense of what, what it is um, in trying to understand aging with disability. But so far, we've had only modest progress in creating that type of bridge. And from my sense, we need to do a lot more of bridge building around there. If we'd like to make sure that people who are aging with disabilities sort of don't get left out and are able to have um, a positive, meaningful experiences in later life, and they're included in the way we think about the importance of growing older. So where does that leave us in terms of what our knowledge building is at? Well, I've made this little pyramid chart. And this kind of shows you it's slim. As I mentioned, there's some modest um, increase in scholarship around aging with disability, but it's not an enormous growth. There's some very good research, but there's a limited amount of it. And a lot of it still remains in health and social care. There are only a modest number of new scholars in the field entering each year. So a lot of the people who originally started working on aging with disability topics and issues and with stakeholders in the 1980s are moving closer to retirement now. And it's always been an issue of attracting people to the field. And so we still have that issue. So this becomes important, training the next generation, um, training the people we have right now, um, trying to move this knowledge more broadly out and get more people interested in thinking about aging with disability is important. And one of the challenges, the next bullet, is we really have limited formal education or training on aging with disability. So I teach in the School of Social Work, and in our school, we only have a limited amount of curriculum content on aging and a, a less content even on disability. We certainly do not have much content on aging with disability. And I don't think that's unique in social work schools in the United States or around the world. Um, and for medical or nursing or other programs as well, um, this just isn't a field with a lot of knowledge that's coming through educational training, um, formal education, university training for students. So there's a need to bring that into the curriculum that students learn. There's also a need to move that out into the field with people who are already working. Um, and there's a need to bring it to stakeholders as well for people with disabilities who would greatly benefit from knowing more about what's in the knowledge base and what should they know as they advocate for themselves. And the reason I um, sort of say this in kind of a little bit of a pessimistic or dire way is that we know that there are a growing number of people aging with disabilities. So this population is increasing, but we're not keeping up in terms of making sure that we're developing a knowledge base that's proportional to the number of people who are having this experience. And that's a real problem because it's easy to have people who are aging with disability become excluded or isolated um, as they grow older. And we really need to increase our knowledge base so we make sure people are included and live a long full life. So what else do we need to know? Or in some cases it might be, what else do we need to do? Well, I've highlighted a few areas, there are many more, but in terms of services and supports systems, we really need more innovations to understand outcomes of early interventions at the time of impairment or, or at the time we recognize 
a different ability or disability onset. So just as a simple example, if somebody is experiencing disability in early adulthood, and that's limiting their ability to obtain a job, we need to start thinking about interventions that help them um, uh, seek employment, if that's the right fit for them, or for them to become economically secure, because we don't want to end up with a life course of non-work or non-economic insecurity. That means the person is also insecure economically in later life. Or if perhaps the person has a condition where health promotion is an important piece, um, um, helping them stay healthy and well, we want to, you know, look into that and start working on that early so we can keep them healthy and that they maybe don't um, attain or incur uh, secondary conditions or additional chronic conditions um, that they don't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have if we engaged in health promotion. We also need to take a widened focus on social, cultural, physical, and institutional factors, and I might add, in many cases, political factors. So moving outward beyond the person. A lot of the knowledge that we have built is very individual. It is about health. It's about person's um, support needs or care needs. But looking more widely on the external factors that influence whether or not somebody is living a good life. Um, becomes important to really understand that in terms of time and aging over time. And then I'll add for inclusion, exclusion. So thinking about that um, much more, understanding of interventions um, to address social, economic, and cultural exclusion, more focus on human and civil rights as an underlying rationale for why we're trying to understand what's going on an emphasis on participation and engagement. So really, again, thinking about how people are involved in how they're doing, are they able to do the things they want to do? Um, how, why, why not? How does that change over time? Are there interventions that we can put into place to make sure that people can stay engaged and stay participating? And finally, as we think about emphasis on the person, which is important, we also want to think about the family and the social unit. Um, a lot of times in the United States, a lot of our research is very individual focused. A lot of our programs and services are very individual focused. We rarely think about family interventions or interventions and supports and services that would help the unit to do well. And we need to do more of that. And as we do that, we need to keep thinking about self-determination and choice. So I think key to all of this is really focusing on the idea that as people age, they really we really need to put what they want to do first and foremost. What do you want to do? What's your choice? What's your decision? But really bringing stakeholders into the mix, I think, is critically critically important, both in knowledge building um, and practice. And so finally, as we move towards thinking about advancing knowledge in aging with disability, we really need, going back to this chart, we really need aging with disability needs to be integrated into disciplines so that there's infusion of this concept across disciplines and training. And then we also need it to be its own interdisciplinary field at the same time. We really need to be able to pull out what's unique about aging with disability and how do we want to understand that in a more specific way. We also want to think about having more formal training for researchers and practitioners to work with people for aging with disability, to, but also just to understand the concepts and the experiences and the knowledge base um, to a greater extent so they can be practicing in a more informed way. And then we want to increase efforts to identify and understand what's happening on the ground now. So what are practitioners doing? Um, where things are heading? And um, what can we learn from those people in the field? And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. This is the um, book that I've co-edited with Dr. Bigby. And I hope that you'll have a chance to ask questions. So we'll move on. I, it's with great pleasure to introduce Tal Ariton Bergman, who is a, a senior lecturer in, the, um, in social work, in the discipline of social work, 
at the Trobe University and uh, a member of the Living with Disability Research Centre. Um, she's going to talk um, about the chapter that, that she and I wrote, which is in the book, which is called Supporting Aging People with Intellectual Disability in Group Homes, uh, Past, Present and Future. So over to you, Tao. Thank you, Chris. Um, so today we're just going to now put a spotlight of what's happening for people with intellectual disability um, and in Australia, just um, following um, Michelle's great presentation. So if we're looking at people with intellectual disabilities, we can see that thanks to medical advantage and, and um, social trends, people, there is a huge life in, uh, increase in life expectancy of people with intellectual disability. More and more people are live, now living longer in the community and actually enjoy um, longevity just like uh, in a uh, rates compared to the uh, general population. Um, they are people aging with intellectual disability make up a small but significant proportion of disability service users in Australia. For instance, um, 7.6 percent of all NDIS participants over um, with intellectual disability are over the age of 55. And when we are looking at all the participants of the NDIS, we could see that the vast majority, 81.3 percent, are um, over the age of 65 are people with intellectual disability. Um, there's people with intellectual disability aging with intellectual disability are are a large group and getting larger um, of consumers in group homes, residents of group homes. And um, again, we don't have the specific uh, data about it, but we can, from evidence and anecdotal, we can understand that a lot of people are now in the 50s and 60s uh, living in group homes. So as Michelle said before, this is not uh, a, new, a new phenomena. So since the 80s, um, researchers and advocacy groups began calling um, public policy and services um, to take account for the unique challenges and the age-associated support needs of people with intellectual disability. Um, there is more and more a growing recognition that um, there are some age-related uh, supports that needs to be taken into account. And, services are not doing a good job in um, working with this group. Um, since then, since the 80s, um, we've seen major changes in the context of debates um, because again, changes in the way that we describe and understand disability and aging. Um, we started looking more less at the individual and more about the, um, using a looking at the goodness of fit between the individual and the environment. Uh, we started looking more at um, human rights and people's choice and control over the environment they live. We started looking um, more at consumer choice and quality of life as the desirable outcomes of policy. And this happened in aging and in disability policies as well. Um, and in Australia, we have um, these trends and these uh, changes that are um, evident in many, many policy uh, debates and in um, many conventions and legislations that we've seen over the years. We'll talk a little bit about that in in short time. So in Australia, when we're looking, um, there is a broad aim. And it is about that every citizen, regardless of their age and impairment, should have equal opportunity to healthy and active aging and to access to support necessary to achieve those goals. Great, isn't it? So what do we mean when we're saying active and healthy aging? Um, the World Health Organization has defined it as a process of optimizing opportunities for health, participation, a security in order to embrace quality of life as people age. Um, this is based on the assumptions that, again, people having choice and control over things that are important to them 
is directly and indirectly influenced by the services and support and the structure of society created and funded for them. Okay. Um, central to that is that one central area that people need to have choice about and control about is where they live or where they age. So the Australian government has adopted the World Health Organization determination of aging of place, which is meeting and uh, the desire and the ability of people through the provision of appropriate supports, services and support to uh, remain living in the community of their choice. Aging, this goes beyond just the physical presence of people in their home or in the group home or wherever they live, but it also looks at um, social relationships with other psych people's identity and the sense of belonging. So it's not just where you live, it's about where you feel, where you have the relationship, where people know you, where you acquire services, and where you identify yourself with. So in a broad term, if we're looking at the at Australian policy broadly, they adopted the um, WHO uh, determined of act active aging and healthy aging. So we can see how that puts the, F, puts the focuses on the person and environment fits, fit. It looks on the multiple levels. So the individual, the community, the organization, society, and it requires policy. And we were looking at policy. It looks for, it's called for, again, a top-down policy, but also initiatives that makes it happen. So actually breaking it in into initiatives that and services and supports that um, brings those broad principles into life. So let's do what, let's see what happened with um, policy um, for aging Australian with intellectual disability. So there, historically, the federal level of disability and aged care services system has been divided into uh, according to age. Aged care for people aged over 65 and disability service uh, for people under um, 65. Both systems are um, complemented by, of course, the health mainstream services like health services and social services. So in a way, if a person, and in broad, in broad statement, um, disability, um, and there was a lot of uh, documentation saying that all, all um, systems should be flexible and people should be able to acquire um, services from the most appropriate services for their needs. Great idea, doesn't work. So prior to the NDIS, the Australian government's response was that either a person's dis, uh, needs are either disability or aging related, okay? There were no uh, firm policy to stipulate which sector, aged care or disability, had the responsibility for funding services and delivery for people with um, people aging with intellectual disability. The policy remained in the in the broad level of general statements that um, neglect to define mechanism, how to translate how those great um, intentions were supposed to be happening in practice access to main, mainstream and specialist disability services and the financial resources um, uh, to adopting physical care and social environment and to make sure that people's needs are actually met within the environment that they live in. The consequences of that was that people aging with intellectual disabilities and carers were left to navigate a complex pathway between the systems uh, to, prime, to find the appropriate services to meet their support needs, um, which again, many times resulted in many uh, unmet, unmet needs. Um, there is some re research that shows that there was failure of disability age and healthcare systems to respond adequately to their 
unique combination of support needs. Um, and again, one of the um, consequences that people with many people with intellectual disability found themselves prematurely or inappropriately either in um, aged care facilities or in hospitals. A critical review of the Australian policy between before the NDIS was done um, with a series of um, publication by Big V. Th thank you, Chris, for that. Which he actually brought um, all the issues together. Um, so she observed that the policy structure in such a way that support uh, needs were either disability or age care, but we could you couldn't be a person older person with a disability. So your support needs are either that or that, and that's how you're going to determine where you're gonna get your supports from. Um, the broad issue often meant led to unmet need for people aging with disability because of knowledge gap. Neither the aged care or the disability sector had appropriate services skilled uh, to provide uh, quality support, access, um, there were rigid boundaries between um, aged care and disability sectors, um, restricted access to aged care programs by group home residents under the age of 65. For instance, if a person have a premature aging or premature dementia, um, couldn't access or was very hard to access uh, dementia care. Um, and preventing age uh, related experience to uh, super, people couldn't buy top up, couldn't buy more um, while they were living in the group home. Um, the responsibility for service deliver delivery and funding, again, there was nothing, there was no way to understand where the money should come from. Um, in a way, it's either if you're in the disability sector, you cannot access uh, funding from the aged care because that would be double dipping. <laughs> and the split in this funding um, actually meant that hampered um, collaboration between sectors. So a knowledge transfer between the aged and disability sectors. So the question that had uh, someone asked just before whether they were collaborating, no. <laughs> There was some initial, there was some um, uh, good in, initi uh, initiation, but the, they were very, very small um, that between the two sectors, but they were very strong and weren't funded for a long time. Um, when we look specifically what happened when we are saying that the expectation that people with intellectual disability will be able to, to age in place in their group home, we could see research could uh, we could see that people um, there was lack of clarity what does it mean exactly to age in place in the group home does it mean that people age in place or age and stay within the disability sector does it mean that they are aging in place until such a point that again um, the group home cannot can no longer provide support, or does it mean that people aging in place will age in the group home and we need to accommodate for the services and the support to make sure to meet their changing need as they go. Um, in the group home, there was lack of consistent policy and standards, which um, again, um, there was no way of knowing how to do it or how to fund it in a way. People uh, came up with many strategies and tried to accommodate for different needs, but there wasn't any um, clear guidance of how to support people under what condition should they um, acquire services and support from the aged care. Um, when we, when researchers looked closely on what's happening in the group homes, uh, we could see uh, barriers to accessing disability health and aged care services. We can see that um, supporting people as they age main time constraints uh, for staff. Um, 
people needed to spend more time in what happens for instance if a person is retiring from work or from their day center and they need support um, how do you provide more support how do you provide more hour and roster more hours who's going to fund that all of those things were um, not clear and lack of adequate resources to account to account for any age-related support needs um, Again, any accommodation for services or the, or the, or the physical environment, um, staffing level, staff training, um, professional development, or any funding for inter and intra sector collaboration. So we could see that despite the expectation that people in group homes should have the right, like everybody else, for active aging and to age in place, there has been little funding uh, to accommodate their um, changing needs. So, as we know, we've been seeing uh, rapid and, and very, very big reforms, both in aged care and disability sectors. We are moving to a more uh, market-based service system, moving away from uh, block-funded services, delivery to individual individual lies funding and person-centered um, approaches. Um, in the aged care, we could see that policy have shifted again from individualized and consumer uh, to consumer direct services to the community. We can see that um, a shift in balance in the funding within the aged care from residential um, uh, from residential services to in-home aged care. In the disability sector, the NDIS, I don't need to tell uh, the crowd here oh, what does that mean, but for people uh, with disability, um, it means that the responsibility for funding disability services is now centralized and is rest on the federal government. The NDIS provides individual funding package to eligible people to purchase services according to their, again, disability related needs and their self desirable goals. Um, although for people aging with intellectual disability, although the NDIS is restricted to people age uh, 65 or under, so that means that you cannot access as a, to the NDIS if you, after the age of 65, but if you're already in the system, the legislation provides existing participants to remain in the scheme past the age of 65 or to choose to uh, transfer into age care system at the age of 65 and later. If a person remains in the NDIS, um, then they can purchase supports to meet their age-related needs. Um, from any NDIS providers. And if at some point the person thinks that it's better for them to um, move to the aged care, um, residential care, or to pick up a aged care home package, then um, they permanently transfer into the aged care system and they cannot come back to the NDIS. So if we're looking at the, some of the issues and challenges that we've seen pre the NDIS, let's think about it. So it seems that one of the tension, the big tension is who is responsible to providing supports? So in the hindsight, this has resolved it. It assigned the responsibility to addressing the needs of older people with disabilities solely to the, the disability sector and provided people with disabilities control over which sector better address their needs. People with intellectual disability, in theory now, can purchase a wide array of services to account, to, to account for their needs. Supports are available until the time when the person makes an informed choice to move into the aged care or residential care. Makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense. and. If you think about it, if but it's based on the logic behind it is based on a couple of assumptions, and I want us to spend the next um, 
20 minutes or so and looking at those assumptions. Okay, so the first assumption is the disability service system has the capacity, the knowledge and the skills, the expertise to adequately respond to the changing needs of people with intellectual disability as they age. We'll, we'll look at that for a, in a minute. The second one is the aging um, people with intellectual disability have equal access to mainstream services. Aging people with intellectual disability and people who support them can articulate, claim, manage age-related support services within the disability system. That the age care system can accommodate for older people with intellectual disability with complex needs once they made the decision to move into the um, age care. And that aging people with intellectual disability and people who support them have the knowledge, the skill to successfully navigate between the disability and aged care systems. So let's look at the first one. So the first assignment assumption is the disability service system has the capacity, the knowledge, the skills, the expertise um, to respond to people um, changing need as they age. So um, again, it's really early to evaluate um, the impact of that, but we're going to um, look now at um, some work that has been done to evaluate the NDIS and um, a research that Chris and I has, have been doing about tr trying to understand um, service providers' perception of the NDIS and changes that happened after that when they're providing support for people with intellectual disability. So overall, research suggests that NDIS had increased the levels and types of supports available for older people with disabilities. Um, service providers talked about that they have now more flexibility and they have more opportunities to adjust services um, as needs change. They talked about there are more resources and they have more security that they will be able, as long as a person has um, those supports in their NDIS plan, um, they will be able to provide those supports as they go. And that would provide more opportunity to people to age in place in um, group homes. Um, there is a quote here that we got from one of the managers. I would like to say that this is more, this is more personalized service. I mean, the fact that we are able to increase this uh, staffing and support as we go, um, and cover the cost of staff uh, to do that. Uh, knowing we can uh, react and support clients in the way that they're needed by, uh, basically um, going to accept, uh, accept hours that we need. To have clients to support, to have uh, clients be supported by OT every year for however long. I just think that we are providing better services because of it now. But when we are looking more clear, critically on that, um, we can see that the same issues that were um, before the NDAS still remains. There's still knowledge gap. So um, research suggests that people, that services um, providers do not have the right um, knowledge or the training to understand and to support people age-related needs. Um, let, there is still lack of consistent policy of service standards to how to support people aging with intellectual disability. Um, we can still see ad hoc strategies and things um, responding as they go in order to um, provide services for people as their change, as their need change. Um, one new issue that we do see is that the NDIS pricing and the moving from uh, commission or uh, block funding um, fail to take to account the non-face-to-face costs associated with quality service, such as getting to know the person, such as um, trying to adjust things as they go. Um, there is a bigger burden of uh, administrative cost right now, providing the evidence and helping uh, people prepare for um, the NDIS planning. Um, it fails to take into account, again, 
internal planning to adjust support as uh, things go. Um, services, service providers told me, uh, had stories about how they used to be able to um, work with uh, the dietitian OT on meal, meal management and things like that, and they don't have the time to do that anymore. So because it's not budgeted in the person plan. Um, it doesn't take account of um, staff meeting and professional development advocacy or building partnership between with other services or with other sectors. Um, overall, it's harder and it takes more and it takes more flexibility to support the person uh, with age related. It just makes um, working with the NDIS more complex and it's harder to make to um, and again people need to adjust the support needs and the environment um, in a way it means that there is no incentive um, for services to keep people um, to age in place in group homes um, it's easier to support again people with less complex needs um this again the split of funding again that you can actually provide uh you can actually purchase services um between aged care and and disability sectors continues in a way and it's still there are still very very few initiatives or collaboration between the two sectors the second um assumption is that aging uh people with intellectual disability and the people who support them can articulate can claim and manage age-related support services within the disability service so as long as you um, know what you need and you can claim it and you can get it into your mdis plan you will get supports well that's a good idea but <laughs> aging people with inter intellectual disability we do know not just aging, but people with intellectual disability often struggle to clearly articulate either directly or through the, their family or whoever cares for them, their needs, or ask for sufficient funding. Um, this is even more complicated when we're thinking about aging with intellectual disability, particularly those with, um, again, limited, um, who lived in this institution or with limited, um, informal supports to assist them in articulate their needs. What we see happening right now is that many times um, service providers and um, the group home service goes into this void and help people um, prepare and plan for their planning meeting and advocate for them. Um, that takes a lot of time, that takes a lot of efforts, um, and sometimes, and it does raise uh, concern about uh, conflict of interest. Um, another thing that we are, another, another challenge here is that service providers, family planners, everybody that is involved in uh, this person life are usually have limited understanding of A, what is it, the unique continent, um, combination or condition of aging aging related disability needs the gap and there's a gap in knowledge about what's happening in the group home and what's available in the community so what services can they claim for instance from health and aged care uh, services um, another issue uh, that we can see is plan review service providers um, and and families are talking about um, challenges getting the NDIS plans review in a timely manner. Again, if a person falls or if a person have um, deteriorating health, it happens, it could happen quickly. And to accommodate for the changing need as people um, age in a good way sometimes means that the um, service needs to pick up the tab until they get the plan review. Um, again, there is a quote here that I'm not going to go over, but it, it just, just look at that, that 
at the end of it, we had to pick up the tab for two staff permanently with them. We are not non for we are non for profit, but we can't permanently run at a loss. So this is some of the things that I'm packing right now in in the reality that we are working in. The third um, assumption is the aged care system can accommodate for older people with intellectual disability and complex needs. So once a person made the decision, formed the decision that they are going to move into aged care because the aged care facilities can uh, provide uh, better uh, support for their needs, um, that the assumption is that the aged care system can accommodate. Well, the research doesn't really show that. Um, what we have right now are evidence that aged care facilities are ill uh, prepared to um, meet the complex health and behavioral needs of older people with intellectual disability, that while um, residential aged care providers are skilled in meeting health needs of older people, but their capacity to meet the social needs um, and the human rights of people with um, intellectual disability is quite limited. And again, there is this lack of knowledge of how to do that well, or what does intellectual disability um, mean and how to support people with intellectual disability um, well. Currently, we have the Royal Commission into Aged Care and uh, Quality Safety th that looks at uh, the quality of aged care services and whether their services are meeting the needs of Australian um, in, the, in the community. Um, this includes, and this includes people with intellectual disability in residential um, aged care. And there are some horrible stories about what's going on and how they're ill equipped to meet the um, to meet the needs. There are some good stories as well, but again, um, as a system, there is lack of training, there is lack of understanding. And it's seen, again, we have some evidence that this is not necessarily the best place right now to, to provide quality support for people aging with intellectual disability. And the last assumption is that people with intellectual disability um, can move, have the knowledge and skill and can move um, and have the information and can move between the aged care and disability services. So again, if a, a person feels that the aged care service can provide a better services for them, they need to have, this is, and they're going to leave the disability service. It's a life-changing um, decision. And people need to have support and to have um, independent advice and the accurate information um, available to them to make this decision. Um, right now, there isn't a seamless, um, guidance of when is this decision made, um, how to support the person to make this decision. Uh, there are um, no NDIS rules uh, how to translate, again, uh, the meaning of high level legislation to provide uh, streaming from one system to another, no protocols or referrals from the NDIS to aged care, no monitoring um, of outcomes, and again, if a person leaves everything they know in the group home and move to aged care, um, who's going to be there to support them? Who's going to be there to help them with this transition? So looking forward, what do we need to make this better? So we need to think about the NDIS pathway and pricing, how to accommodate that for people aging with disability, how to make a timely uh, review as, as um, needs change, how to make sure that um, people have um, a good support to make decision and to navigate the NDIS uh, pathway. Um, I, I think that uh, forming an inde independent government funded advocacy or broker service to assist aging people with intellectual disability to navigate the NDIS, the health and the aged care service is highly needed. 
um, somebody needs to have that knowledge. Somebody needs to be able to provide those links between the different systems to know what's out there and to help people access that information. <coughs> I think, excuse me. I, I think that we need to um, think about <coughs> workforce planning and uh, training strategies for mainstream disability service providers and lack of uh, and then and DII uh, workers. We need to make sure that people have the skills and the knowledge and the competence to work with people with intellectual disability, aging with intellectual disability. <coughs> we need to have a nationally consistent policy and standard and standards for supporting aging people with intellectual disability in group homes or wherever. But we need to know what are quality support for people aging with intellectual disability looks like. We need to be able to plan better services and provide better quality of services. Um, if a person clear policies of transferring and um, the interface between disability, health, and age care system into clear rules and guidance. And funding, um, we need to find and to build better cross-sectional partnership and knowledge, knowledge and, and skills transfer between the different sectors. And thank you very much.